Welcome to the CEO.com show. My name is Clint Betts. On today's show, I interview Divi co-founder and CEO, Blake Murray. Blake and Divi recently went through an acquisition with Bill.com, where Bill.com purchased Divi for two and a half billion dollars. Two and a half Bs. Divi went publicly launched. I think I think Blake was working on it. Blake and the team was working on it around 2016, which is still not that long ago, but I think they publicly launched in 2018, which we talk about in this conversation, to have that type of success from 2018 to 2021 and to sell for two and a half billion dollars. This does not happen very often. This is an incredible growth story. Blake Murray is a great leader, a great friend. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Blake, I can't thank you enough for doing this. We're come, uh, we're talking on the heels just a couple months ago of Divi getting acquired by Bill.com for an astronomical amount. We'll talk about that. I mentioned that in my intro, but I want to talk first just about your journey as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a CEO, as building um, Divi into what it is and what it continues to be. And you're still leading Divi as the CEO. But you come from an interesting background, which I don't know that you and I have ever really talked about. Your dad is a tech legend. How much of, and you, maybe yeah. you should explain to those watching who your dad is and kind of what the roles he's played. He's like the Forrest Gump of tech, as I understand it. He's kind of was in the middle of everything uh, back in the days when uh, the Steve Jobs era, the Bill Gates era, all those, all those types of things. And I, I want to learn, learn more about your dad and how his influence, being the tech legend that he is, um, maybe put you on the path you're on today, or maybe it had nothing to do with it. I no, for sure. That's uh, one a really interesting topic, but also my path was not like his. I wish it was more direct, but uh, so I, I mean, to cut to the chase, my dad had an incredibly storied career. It, it truly is one of those of kind of fiction where. I think a lot of us in tech uh, wish we could rub elbows and learn from uh, some of the titans that he was not able, not just able to learn from, um, but uh, uh, he had his hand in, in some of the most important early projects in, in tech. And so he went to Stanford in the 70s. Um, and it was during Stanford as a first year grad student uh, getting his MBA where he went to, I believe, I don't want to misquote him, especially kind of on the spot, but this is how I remember at least him telling the story. Uh, he went to kind of like an evening uh, fireside chat and it was by a young guy named Steve Jobs and it was a packed house. Uh, and he stood there for the hour or two listening to Steve Jobs talking about uh, not only Apple, but uh, about personal computing and how it was going to be uh, absolutely transformational, not only to, to families, but to how all of us interacted with the world and interacted with each other. And during the meeting and after the meeting, I, I think he was probably experiencing similar to what most of us do of like this general confusion about life of what do I do? What's my purpose? What am I actually interested in? And I think that was a really uh, pivotal moment for him where he was like this, this is it. This just spoke to to me, to my core, to like my my inner soul. Something just woke up, and and I have to I have to go here, not just in the space, but I have to go figure out how to go work for this guy who is my age. But you know, I, I got to go work for him, and because I just know that goodness is going to come from that. And uh, I, I think that it, it was an incredible example of hustle and to really kind of summarize it, but uh, he, he got on and he cold called Apple until they paid attention to him. Uh, I think he somehow even got like Steve Jobs uh, uh, executive assistance number and uh, would just cold call the crap out of them until they paid attention to him, interviewed him and, and then hired him. And he was one of the earliest then uh, team members. And I believe that was in 75, 76, something like that. Um, so this is very early on. And, this uh, is super early on, right? Like super, this is super early stages. Seventy-five. 
I bet Steve loved the cold call, by the way. That's that's like what he did when he was a kid. I'm sure you've read the famous biography by Walter Isaacson did on um, Steve Jobs where he cold called Hewlett Packard. And he actually got the yeah. CEO of Hewlett Packard to see Steve yeah. Jobs. In. So I'm sure Steve loved the, the cold calling approach. I bet that was super useful. Yeah. Yeah. And so not only was he fortunate to then have a very material job there um, in sales, marketing, some product development, uh, that famous commercial of uh, that 1984 commercial uh, where, you know, it's the woman running through is the Super Bowl oh, yeah. commercial and still to this day kind of spoken of as kind of the perfect uh, commercial. Uh, that was my dad's brainchild. He's just a really creative, interesting guy. And so he, he brought that to life working with a famous director. I can't remember who it was off the top of my mind, but uh, uh, he had an incredible professional experience there. But I think way more meaningful to him was his personal relationship with Steve as, as they became very, very close. Um, and and uh, Steve Jobs became close even with my mom and kind of the three of them uh, would lean on each other for support and commiserate with each other. Uh, you know, my dad was kind of this albatross in this group of really young, brilliant, hard charging uh, uh, individuals, but then he had four young kids. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, not only a topic of conversation with uh, the uh, Apple executive team, but it was something then that Steve wanted for himself uh, when he looked at this little Murray family. Um, and so <laughs> he used to, I mean, there's stories of him coming over super late at night uh, where, you know, us kids are in bed and he would just sit with my parents and being like, I, how do I get this in my life? How do I get balance in my life? And so, you know, we love sitting around with my dad and, and uh, hearing his stories again, that I think touch more on the personal level. He's got incredible stories of, you know, the crazy meetings and contriving these, crazy strategies to outposition IBM and because IBM was already massive at that point. Um, but then the other component of that is some of the fallout of when Steve was fired um, and my dad was uh, just loyal uh, as could be to him. He was like, if Steve's not running it, I'm out. Uh, he went to grad school with Steve Ballmer. And so that's when after a period of a, a different pit stop, Steve Ballmer recruited my dad over to Microsoft and my dad joined Microsoft 88, 89, something like that. Now, before they had any kind of HR practice stood up, any formal people in places, um, and he was able to build all of that for them uh, throughout the 90s and also then became very close on a personal level with Bill Gates and some of these other just really fascinating individuals. I grew up hearing names like Nathan Mirvold, who is just a tech giant, uh, um, Frank Gaudet, who um, was a really meaningful influence uh, to my dad, and also just a business genius. He was he was brought in by Bill Gates early on to kind of be the adult in the room, because all of them were just too young and uh, just shooting from the hip and trying to build Microsoft, and Frank was brought in to be the adult. Um, but yeah, he had uh, an incredible career, and then, not to belabor the point, but then from there, after Microsoft, which I believe he left in 99 or 2000, I would suggest he built his most important one, which was um, before microcredit financing or kind of Kiva and, the, and these other really incredible microcredit organizations that are focused on the most impoverished communities, uh, really trying to lift women especially out of poverty. Um, that, that concept was the, the brainchild or you know, he, he was one of the creators of it. My dad was with uh, two other really just fantastic individuals, and they created an organization called Unitas. Um, and and uh, Unitas then has lifted millions and millions of people uh, out of poverty uh, by helping them start their own businesses on these uh, small micro loans and creating systems of accountability and returning and reporting. Now, I mean, he poured his heart and soul into that. And so, uh, just what a great example, a great example of, I think, of self-awareness, of being aware of what his skills were, of giving his heart and soul to whatever he was in as well. Uh, at the same time, he was just a fantastic husband and father, um, but uh, it definitely gave me a significant bar to shoot for in, in my personal life, in my career. Well, I get the sense that your your father means a lot to you. And you, 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 you are close now and you were very close growing up. I, I'd love to touch on what your childhood experience was like. Did you have a sense 
when Steve Jobs was coming over and you guys all had to go to bed, did you have a sense that that was abnormal? Like that, the fact that Steve Jobs so, was at your house, exactly. did you have that or was it just, this is who dad is? I was too young to remember any of that. You know, I was like, a, it was my twin brother and I, we were babies, but uh, I vividly remember the Microsoft days. And mm. we, we lived in Redmond, Washington. Um, my family went to Bill Gates' wedding. I think we were one of two families of kids that were invited to Bill Gates' wedding, flown out to Hawaii. And so I do remember, like, this is not normal because Bill Gates was already Bill Gates at that point. It wasn't mm -hmm. like he was this up and coming uh, big tech executive. Uh, his ascent well, it was pretty rapid at the global scale. And so I do remember um, knowing and, and respecting that what he was working on and achieving was extraordinary in the truest sense. Um, and my parents did a good job, though, of being pretty blunt with us. Of This isn't normal. Don't let it get to your heads. You know, kind of the, mm, the talks behind the scenes to your kids that you hope to try to figure out how to keep them grounded and not turn them into spoiled brats. Um, so yeah, I think that's just part of trying to be a parent. But yeah, to answer your question, I, I think we knew that what he was working on was uh, pretty crazy at the time. As a kid, given who your father was and what he was doing and the people he was rubbing shoulders with, did you imagine that this is what you would be doing as a career too, getting into tech, building companies? No, I, I like to think that my path was this, uh, you know, crazy rambling path that ultimately I led into tech. But as I get older and as I just get to know more people, I, I actually think my story is a little more similar uh, to kind of some success stories than just this direct immediately injected into you know, the, the pipeline of successful companies. Uh, my path was, uh, I love animals. I, I love animals more than I love people. I, I'm naturally very introverted. As a CEO, I can turn it on uh, and mm -hmm. I can uh, tell stories and I love it and I love working with people and I love kind of that part of my life. But being around people absolutely just takes energy out of me, right? It's uh, my ideal weekend is uh, some time with my wife and kids and <laughs> just kind of being quiet, you know? Um, and, uh, so I, I, I always believed that I was going to be a wildlife biologist as a freshman in college that summer, I went and worked in Africa, uh, with a world renowned elephant, uh, conservationist named Joyce Poole. Um, after I served a Mormon mission, I went and did some more. I got my degree in environmental sciences. I believed I was going to go, um, get graduate degrees in wildlife biology and then go spend my time, you know, saving the whales and saving the elephants and, and working with them. Um, but, uh, I, I had children at a very young age and I had at one point in one of my trips to Africa, I had left my wife with an eight month old and I believe pregnant with a second at that point. And we have three kids. So like we had kids really early and really young and it all felt unfair and it all felt very selfish to me. Uh, it all felt unfair that I was leaving her and my kids and that I wasn't there um, when, when they were young. And so that's where I had to abandon uh, that career path. And, and then from there started what I, I, I felt like, again, was going to be a direct route and towards wildlife bi biology, jumping around all over the place. I dropped out of law school. I dropped out of an MBA program each after a year in each two separate programs. I joined a commercial real estate fund, um, which was easily the most boring job I've ever had in my life, but then totally <laughs> formative now that I look back on it to the skills that that I've, I've um, achieved uh, from a literal underwriting perspective because we we're underwriting assets that we we're trying to invest in um, to understanding contracts to uh, really um, utilizing contracts to, I don't know, from a competitive advantage and leverage. And so I was bored out of my mind during that. Uh, but man, that ended up being important. Um, and then I, well, that makes sense why you job. dropped out of law uh, school. After. That would have been your most boring job. Oh. Had you stay in law school oh, and become a lawyer. I, <laughs> I, I was bored out of my mind. Hey, actually, if you want to go down a tangent, I went to law school with a very strate uh, strategic and different uh, motive. And I've never spoken publicly about it. Yeah, those that know me know kind of the whole story behind the scenes because it was just crazy how it unfolded. Um, but I went to law school to get recruited by the CIA. 
uh, my goal was that, that that I would be able to check that box and that, right. and that was kind of the last box I needed that they would notice and that I would get recruited. And I did. So I did get recruited by the CIA and which was a dream scenario, a process of about eight or nine months. Uh, and I, I was recruited. It was uh, through the, um, the, the job that I wanted was to become an operations officer. And that is through the clandestine services. Um, right, right. So that is uh, where you're over in foreign countries and you're, you know, a, a, essentially a spy. You're, you're posing as a different career and, and then you're working as a spy. And, and that was my absolute goal of my life. Uh, like truly, like if you act like that was more than animals. And, and so I did, I actually got recruited and that was just wait, a, wait, 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 wait. A really so, thrilling, exciting period. So why, why was that what you wanted to do? That That's fascinating. You uh, were going to law school specifically to get recruited by the CIA, CIA. That was your goal. You actually did get recruited by the CIA, but why was that what you wanted to do? What, what about that? excited you and got you fired up and made you i mean you um, went to law school for that like law school sucks dude law school sucked it was terrible um the i love this country a, a, a bizarre amount uh, with right. a a passion that uh like talking about it for 30 more seconds i'll start getting emotional about it and it's it was a way that I felt like I could serve and use the skills that I have um, to be meaningful and to, to, to truly be an asset to the country um, from language capabilities to my persuasive capabilities um, to some other elements, you know, that are, are just part of that job that I felt like I would have been really, really good at. In, in service is is something that's important to me and it's something that I wanted to give in perpetuity to the country. Um, anyway, long story short, uh, I got to the last step, which is getting your conditional offer of employment after you passed all these checks. You know, you, you get kind of your assignment of a hardship tour of duty, which is going to kind of a wartime area. Um, and I never heard from them again. And my heart was totally, totally broken after eight mm. or nine months of going through all the jumping through the hoops and meeting with them and flying all over the place to meet with them and interviews and all this kind of stuff and assessment tests. Um, and I never heard from them again. So obviously I didn't get selected. Uh, and that was pretty devastating. That was like right smack dab during a, you know, trying to have a plan B, C and D from providing for my family and these investment real estate funds and all that kind of stuff. But I came back to Utah, my cousin, Brandon Rodman, is the CEO or was the CEO of a, a company called Weave here in Utah. And it was tiny at that point. And he gave me an opportunity to invest some money into the business and then to come and work there. And that's where I cut my teeth then, really cut my teeth in, in the tech ecosystem here in Utah. And, and so it was a much uh, more winding and, and, and less direct path into technology. But uh, that's once I got back here into Weave is, is, is where I started to get back into tech. And at what point do that you start? That was a long answer to a short question. That was wonderful, man. Uh, at what point do you start thinking about Divi and this idea that that um, really was revolutionary? And, and we're going to talk about fintech, the future of fintech, all that type of stuff. But fintech wasn't what it was um, now where fintech is just exploding when when yeah. you started divi or when you were thinking about about divi it wasn't a proven um industry or at least a subset of the, of the overall technology industry at what point during yeah, all no, of this right. and there i mean there is some fintech inside of weave now in particular i'm not sure that that was a big piece of it even back then but but weave i would even consider a, a fintech company at this point um, and people can, we'll probably have Brandon on this show and people can learn about what Weave is and what they do. But at what point were you thinking about Divi? And I want to branch out and do something on my own. So it was February, end of January, beginning of February of 2016. I had left Weave a few years earlier and I had started as a franchisor. So owning a bunch of territories Idaho, Utah, I think it's some pieces of Colorado or something like that, of a uh, pizza fast casual franchise, similar to kind of like Blaze Pizza. 
and and they sold me hard. And I I had a chance with the the group that did the Series A of that investment uh, to kind of participate and to kind of own some of these territories. And so here I was pretty young, thinking that th that would be incredible passive income for my family, right? Because everybody looks at franchises and thinks that they all work uh, and, and that they print money. Um, and so we pulled the trigger and we did it. And they ended up being the single worst investments that I've ever made in my life. Um, <laughs> it, where it's the probably just because I was naive about the restaurant industry, uh, but also top down, they weren't organizationally ready to grow as fast as they wanted to. And as a franchisor, you don't have any control over that. You're, you're just up to kind of whatever the broader company is doing. Um, but they were insolvent, they were a financial mess, the, the businesses. And so again, what was supposed to be a side project, uh, for me, I had to dive in head first to all of a sudden save this and, and to fix each one of the individual units and then the broader group that now I was in charge of um, to figure out how to not lose just a metric ton of money. And it was in that process of diving in not only to the financials, but then into the software stack of like, how can I just get more information in real time about what is going on with my business? Like, are you kidding me? This accounting software, all of this finance software is so out of date. Everything that you're showing me is stuff that happened 90 days ago. That's not helpful. I need to know what's going on right now. And it was in that process where what I realized was, yes, what I was experiencing from just a process perspective uh, was largely ubiquitous with small businesses, meaning you just lacked visibility. But the more important thing that drove me to Divi was that the fear, like the literal and visceral fear that I was feeling as a small business owner of making payroll, about surviving another month, about you know uh, taking things from the red to the black uh, was absolutely ubiquitous with small business owners. You go and talk to any small business owner and at some point in their journey, no matter how big or small, how mature or immature they are in their process, they have felt those same elements of fear. And it's largely, you can trace it back to, I just don't know what's going on. I don't have enough data. I cannot see into kind of the actual mechanics of my business financially and see what's going on in real time. And what we understood pretty quickly was that there was a relationship between your banks and then the software stack and then a massive freaking gap, huge gap of, of how to get them to work with each other and to sync with each other. And instead of trying to integrate those, kind of the aha moment for us was those should be one in the same. Right. If, if my bank and how I make payments in my organization and how I receive payments in my organization is the same as the finance stack in the software stack that I'm using to for all the finances, uh, you will just have a real time flow of information and you'll be much more agile. You'll be able to adjust on the fly. You'll be able to make decisions right now that can prevent failure in a few weeks or a few months and accelerate growth on the positive side, right? It's not just about preventing failure. It's also, do I have the information uh, to drive growth? Um, and, and it was a lightning bolt, bolt mo moment, Clint, where the kind of the succession of connecting those dots occurred in a single day. And it was within then two weeks, I was investing money into building this out because it was just so clear as day in my mind. What did your dad think? I assume you talked to your dad, maybe probably the first person you talked to about this idea or one of the first people you talked to about no. this idea. What did he think? Yes. You didn't? First. Oh, he wasn't uh, the first. That's interesting. Yeah. He was not the first. The very first was uh, my co-founder, Alex Bean. Um, he was the first, but my dad, I went to him in May. Uh, I, I simmered on it and wanted to make sure that my, my logic, my reasoning and business case was not only sound, but that it was just rock solid. And then I went to him and, and again, what you're, you're trying to kind of bump up against people, pressure test, what's their initial reaction? Do they kind of like sit back and think about it for a little bit? Do they grimace? Are they leaning in? And it's it, to me, I was just trying to pay attention to all of that. And and he looked at me and he's not one. He, he's not a puff piece person. If it's not right, he's going to be like, Blake, I really think you should spend time doing something else. Like, mm -hmm. let me tell you why. This is when he was like, you got something here. You got something here. Like, how do we make sure that you're headed in the right direction. And so 
I, he, he felt it also pretty quickly. He could tell that my research was incredibly thorough um, and that I had mapped out, here's the end in mind. And I had mapped out in that short amount of time, uh, effectively a playbook uh, of what that user experience and product needed to look and act like for it to be successful. How validating was that to hear that from your dad? I, I assume you were probably thinking, I'm all in on this. I really like this idea. But once he says it, someone who, like, like we've mentioned before, someone who means a lot to you, uh, uh, your father, your mentor, all that type of stuff. Um, was it just like, all right, I got something. Was that like a light bulb moment in the journey? Yeah, it was actually, I'll be honest, because the other side of it is I, I'd already learned in my career um, that not all advice is created equal. I think when you have a good idea, the the kind of the inclination for anyone and kind of just human nature is to go start talking about it with anyone and everyone, you know, assuming that as much feedback as I get is going to be helpful. But why? If they're not a subject matter expert, if they don't have experience, they don't, if it's not real, like you shouldn't be seeking feedback from that person. And so from a Divi perspective, I was actually really quiet by design outside of a few selected people. And you and I have spoken about, you know, I was working with the Gundersons who are a development agency here in Utah, but we had a really tight knit group of people that knew kind of what was living in my head. And so then going to my dad and then not just talking to him, but kind of pitching him and really pitching the business and not just the product mm -hmm. for the first time. And for that to be received so well, uh, that was, that, that was good that it was important. And again, context matters because I'd pitched him probably 20 other businesses before and never had a positive response ever, you know? <laughs> and so finally getting a real positive response uh, and not just positive, but like, whoa, Blake, this is yeah. big. Uh, that we, we knew we had something pretty big. That's incredible. And how validating is that? And, and you just mentioned something and I want to give some context to it. You mentioned the Gundersons, who who I've worked with. They're like, they're like brothers of mine. Uh, I live in Utah. They're like Utah legends within the startup community. Very wonderful people. But they were running a software development shop at the time, like an outsourced software development shop. And what they would do is they'd work with early stage startups and founders. They'd help them build like an initial MVP, right, or prototype or anything like that. And then the idea was like to get that company to a point where they could transition an in-house team. I bring that up only because that's a model that you did. You, you, you went to an outsourced uh, software development team, you built kind of the MVP, and then you obviously transitioned it into its own thing. And it be, but what was that process like that initial, like working with a software development firm, picking the right software development firm, uh, picking the right partners to do that with, and then eventually saying like, all right, uh, the, I, the firm was called Aizeni back in the day that the Gunderson brothers uh, yeah. ran. And, and all right, Izeni, we've gotten everything we can out of you. It's time for us to transition this to all in-house and we're going all in on this. What was that whole process like for you? At first, scary. For a non-technical founder, um, you, you are, where your strengths aren't there and you literally have zero skill set of even how to do a wireframe, right? For a mobile app or for a web page, you don't know how to do any of that, but you have all the ideas that are here. I needed somebody to help take what was living here and put it into screens. And, and that's, that's the very specific help I needed because then I could give direction just on my own kind of confidence on the aesthetics of it, of how it needed to look. I just had an incredible amount of trust in my own skill in that, but I didn't know how to do that. Um, and Izeni was probably one of the only one, two or three groups in Utah at the time that had a track record of success. And then I had known them a little bit, but like brush shoulders a little bit uh, because of their work also with Weave. And so again, there was just mm -hmm. an embedded level of trust because they had been working with some of the better uh, Utah tech companies and helped them get off the ground. Um, and, and that's then what Izeni and myself, we really focused on. Uh, we focused on making sure that we could design a user experience that would be a no-brainer to all kind of the different stakeholders that would need to use Divi. There was actually a really logical baton pass. So the conversation of moving off of them was not, never difficult uh, because the, meaning they also then realized that, whoa, the technology you're gonna be forced to build is, it's not that it was outside of their skill set. It was just going to be too massive of a project because of having to build into banks and these 
um, APIs that really didn't exist at the time. Um, so their advice to me was, we'll get you to this point. We'll get you to where you have functional wireframes on mobile. We'll get build your you know your web page for you. We'll build even the wireframes on web on web. Um, but any material code, you're going to need to go hire uh, some engineers. And oh, by the way, here are some suggestions of who we think you should be looking at. Um, and, and so they even helped with pointing me in the right direction of early engineers that we should be looking at in hiring. Um, but what I would say to not undersell their impact, their wireframes are a direct result of why we were able to land our big commercial agreements that we landed at the very beginning, right? Our first one was with U.S. Bank, who at the time I think was the fourth or fifth largest bank in the United States. Um, and, and we were able to take what we had, a, a functioning MVP, uh, to Minnesota. We find ourselves sitting in the HQ, you know, in a room all of a sudden, you know, it's Alex Bean and I, uh, we're, we're sitting with 14 other professionals. They're all wearing suit and tie. And we're like, holy crap, this is bizarre. <laughs> but then we give the pitch of a lifetime. And we, we tell this story of this shift uh, of how small business owners are going to, with confidence, we said, you may not believe it, but we promise you that, that small businesses, they do not care about their cash back. They care about the value that you add to them. And the logical shift is going to be, um, you know, this convergence of uh, payments with, uh, with uh, software or banking with software. And those screens were really, really important to, to pulling all that off. We walked away with an agreement with them. So, And that meeting with US Bank must have been one of the, the times in the journey of it. Obviously, the validation of the idea, and this is something I should pursue, talking to Alex being your co-founder, talking to your father, getting that validation is a big deal, working with Izeni, you know, them putting up those wireframes, helping you build the product. That's a, that's probably another validation along the journey. But then that meeting that you just mentioned with U.S. Bank and actually selling and getting them to understand, like you said, it was like the pitch of a lifetime, the meeting of a lifetime. Um, was that the first time you're like, this is actually going to be something? Because, you know, this journey, like who knows if any oh, of this yeah. is actually going to be anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that is no doubt the meeting. And that was the end of May of 2016, uh, where we knew that we had a tiger by the tail. Um, it, and, and not just because of how they received it, kind of their emotional response to the presentation we gave, but then what materialized afterwards, which was, you know, an agreement that had real revenue baked into it. <laughs> I mean, we, we were embarrassed to admit, but now five years later, it's fine admitting it. I had no idea what interchange was, right? Interchange being the revenue or the transaction fee that is assessed to every single transaction. And, right. I, and all of a sudden they're giving us this contract where they're giving us a portion of that. And Alex and I were like, what? We have revenue. And so it's, uh, you know, we obviously became experts in it afterwards, but uh, we were very excited by that. At what point did you start thinking about raising capital um, from venture funds or taking outside capital? What what was your strategy around raising money throughout uh, the early days of Divi? Our strategy from day one was to optimize for control, which sounds very, very weird. Um, can I actually answer it a little sideways? Of course. There, there is a pretty consistent and, and persistent narrative in just social media. Really, you see it in LinkedIn, which can just be a cesspool. Um, but of you know, bootstrap businesses versus uh, venture back businesses, and that one is somehow better than the other. And it's it's so disappointing because you know any intelligent individual, and especially adult, should recognize that you know, rarely is life as binary as that. And that they're, it's, they both can be great. They both can be bad. You know what I mean? And there's so much gray that exists between them. We made a decision. I, I've run the bootstrap businesses. Like I've done it. Oh yeah. Great. Yeah. It, that was, it was a fantastic experience where I learned a, a hell of a lot. Um, but as a venture back business, your goals are different. Your expectations are different. Now, from a growth perspective, from a revenue perspective, from a customer acquisition perspective, from a, a virality perspective. So you use the capital in a very different way. 
And so our objective was to get Divi into as many hands as humanly possible. If we were a bootstrap business trying to do that against other fintechs or against other banks, who really was our competition at that time that had massive distribution and channels, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that, invest enough capital uh, for, in, in a bootstrap perspective. So we did it as a venture backed business. But we wanted to preserve control as a venture backed business, which meant that when offers started to come, we weren't always looking at the highest valuation because sometimes the higher valuation would come with an additional board seat or it would come with different voting rights or it would come with uh, more dilution. I don't know, right? It always came with something like an alternative yeah. that you had to weigh. Um, yeah, and sure. we always wanted to opt for control where not only would I end up being the largest shareholder, but that we'd control the votes at the board level because we believed Alex and I and then my executive team that we knew how to run the business, not the investors, not the venture capitalists, and, and also not the board. Even if they had our best interests at heart, they didn't know how to run the business. Um, and so one, that's what we optimized for. Uh, but uh, it, so it was in probably 2017 that we decided to, yes, we're going to become a venture back business. Um, it, first we did a friends and family round that was pretty material. And it was uh, my dad, some of his peers, uh, some my, my family and myself, we, we funded the business first. Um, and then we, and that was really to get us through end of development through a really strong beta, right? Just testing the hell out of the product and really working with the initial customers. And then we launched in January of 2018. January 1st, 2018 was our official first day to market. Um, and, and Divi was received just really well. So that was exciting. And probably about uh, at the end of January, I, I started to get a lot of inbound from institutional investors. of so like, whoa, this is like a crazy idea. Like, can we just meet with you? And it was really fun and it was flattering. But that's where you have to just kind of put it into check and, and make sure you know, again, what you're optimizing for and, and uh um, what you're looking for in investors. And so then it was after about five months, we decided to take an investment and it was with the, uh, a Utah firm called Paleon Ventures. And they're the largest fund here in Utah. And so they had the capacity to make a material investment as a series A investment. Um, but they also had the ability to follow on, right? To continue to, right. if they believed in us, to continue investing in us, which was important to me. Um, and, and they were just excellent, excellent partners. Um, but then it just, it went fast when we did an investment like two months later with insight ventures out of uh, New York, less than a year later from NEA ventures, one of the largest Silicon Valley funds, but in every single round I optimized for control and would kind of push some of the other investors that were interested to the side. Um, and, and we were really happy with that because then ultimately when this, when, when the business got really difficult. Uh, during the height of Corona, um, we were able to look out for our people. We were able to look out for the business. Uh, and although I felt an accountability to investors, um, they were never in the driver's seat. I was able to mm -hmm. look at my executive team, kind of shut the door from the investors and say, what are we going to do? How are we going to solve these problems? And man, am I glad that we had that clarity back in before we raised our first round, um, because I feel like obviously in hindsight, it was the right thing to focus on for us. By the way, Pelion Ventures doesn't get enough national pub. They've been behind some incredible, huge companies. Yeah. I know everyone always talks about like Andreessen Horowitz and Sequoia and Insight. Insight's another legendary firm that, that you, that you got to work with. But Pelion Ventures, man, unbelievable team over there. Blake Moderitsky, um, who is the managing partner over there. Just just unbelievable people. How, I, here's Here's my question around that, though. Who's advising you? Who are you listening to? Who's coaching you that optimizing for control is going to be important back then? Hmm. Or is that just instinctive? Because that's it was rare, as you know. It, it was instinctive. It was the nobody told me to do that. It was trying to pay attention to the horror stories that you read about in, in Twitter of, of kind of the, the nasty side of venture capital. I think there are some uh, from Utah, right? You just kind of get to know the ecosystem of the community you're in, or you should at least. And there's some horror stories of where investors kind of you know, took control of businesses and took them sideways. And, and I just never wanted that to happen. 
uh, from a very selfish perspective, I didn't want it to happen to me. And certainly we didn't want it to happen to our team members here. So yeah, I, I think it just was a decision that Alex and I made early on. You said something early on in this conversation that I want to circle back on. Um, and it was probably like a throwaway line, but I don't know, like as you've been talking this whole time, it's, it's stuck with me. Cause I think our personalities are actually quite similar. You, you say like, Hey, I, I, I can turn it on and be a leader and I can turn on being the CEO, but my preference is actually not to do that. It's very much like me. Like I, I don't know if I can turn it on as well as you, but, but I'm certainly like the type of person who would much rather like read, right. Or just be alone or go for walks or go for runs or whatever it is. Right. And this whole idea of like you being able to turn it on, I'd love to explore that a little bit more with you, what that means, what that means. And uh, just overall, how you experience that. Cause you really can kind of turn things on and off. Huh? A lot of people don't talk about that piece. Yeah. What do you want me to start with on that? Well, what do you, what, when you said that, so when you said that again, like the light bulb just went off on me, I'm like, turn it on. That's a, that's fascinating that he can turn on being like this incredible kind of leader. You've said like, Hey, I can be persuasive. I can I'll do this type of stuff. Um, but your preference is not to do that. And so what does that mean to you and how do you do that? Yeah, it is. It means, um, being my, and this is just business buzz, buzzwords like garbage fest in, in a second. So just, you know, pardon me, um, but it is being my authentic self and unfiltered in just who I am. Uh, I don't have versions of who I am. And so I don't want right. that to be misconstrued. And so when I turn it on, it's the type of Blake that my wife would see, my brother would see, my close knit group of friends totally unfiltered, sometimes a little hot-headed, sometimes a little crass, um, but just one of you. And I've never loved the, the idea of being a figurehead CEO or, or somehow needing to, um, I don't know, of, of, of trying to be somebody that I'm not yeah, and to act the part. So my version of turning it on is is expecting a lot of people asking a lot of people both verbally and through action um but it's because and i'll only do that because i know that i have a track record of doing it myself and so it gives me incredible confidence to sit stand in front of a room and absolutely expect it from the rest of the room and so i've always tried to lead by example um and and then i will ask them to follow the example that I have set. That sounds really weird. And I hate talking. No, about it doesn't. Myself. No, I no, no, no. Do. Like it's so uncomfortable, but, but storytelling has also been just naturally quite easy for me. I um, mean, storytelling is such an important skill as a CEO oh, from sure. recruiting to uh, maintaining and increasing buy-in from the people you already have, uh, to getting investors, to your first sales and customers. It is just absolutely criti critical to, uh, I would suggest not just to be being a great CEO, but really any leader and executive. The best leaders are incredible, incredible storytellers because they don't just tell you what to do. They persuade you that you want to do it, like deeply, you want to do it. Uh, and so they awaken something in you. And, and the only way that I know how to awaken people is to lead by example and then to ask them to follow me. And I, and I want to just for, for those listening, because I think everything that you just said is so important for people who are leaders now, want to be leaders, want to be entrepreneurs, want to start companies, all that type of stuff. And, and I want you mentioned this in here and I want to double click on it for those who are listening or watching. What you're talking about is not manipulation, which a lot of people could uh, perceive it as, right? As though like this is like the way I'm able to manipulate people into doing what I want. That's not what you're talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what this conversation is. And I think it's important that I bring that up here. This isn't manipulation. What, like what you said, it's like being your authentic self. As you said that, I was thinking about this episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. I don't know if you've seen that. It's Jerry Seinfeld. He drives around in old cars with comedians. Yeah, I've seen it every now and then. 
he has this episode with Dave Chappelle, who's maybe the most prominent and, you know, famous and greatest comedian of our generation. All that's arguable, but he's certainly up there. Um, and he's talking to Jerry at this coffee shop. I believe it's in Washington, D.C. And he says, a lot of people think the guy on stage is the inauthentic person. And he said, it's actually the exact opposite. <laughs> the guy on stage is authentically Dave Chappelle. The guy off stage is just trying to create space and room and ability for that guy to do what he wants to do and be who he wants to be and be his authentic self. It's not possible to always be on is what I get from that. And what I get from what you just said, you're not always on. It's not possible. And sometimes you do need to just like kind of decompress and have time with yourself. And there are, there are you, I know you said like, there's not like different versions, of, but there's different versions of how we present ourselves both to others and ourselves, which is the most important part. Right. And sometimes you're just like, yeah, hey, I just, I'm not going to be on in the uh, sense of like what that normally means to me. I'm just going to chill, decompress and think. When, when I think about my growth, just in general, of not just as a leader, because that's just a portion, or as a CEO of who I am, that the growth of me isn't a result of my successes. It's a result of being in the depths of sorrow on the personal or professional life of my absolute struggles, um, because there's a cause and effect relationship uh, if you're introspective enough between a struggle and the effect it can have on your life. And the effect, at least for me, is it, it forces introspection. It forces you to ask questions of yourself of, um, am I becoming who I want to become? Am I achieving my potential you know, to the very best of my ability? Am I helping people feel good when they're with me? Um, and, and that's where, um, I've tried to share internally here at Divi, uh, very freely and openly about my own personal failures within reason, right? Sometimes some sure. details are best yeah, of course. Left unsaid, um, to, to help inspire and create growth in others. I would hate for people to have to experience, you know, failures if they can somehow learn from mine. And so that's a really key part for me of uh, being authentic is, is sharing your, all of you, warts and all, um, and, and then asking people to forgive those warts um, and, and to grow together and to improve together. together I don't have a lot of time with you. And all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't have a ton of time with you. We need to do this again because, you like I said, we and I can always – uh, go deep on this type of stuff. But I want to finish out the Divi story for those who don't know it. Um, the pandemic hits. Yeah. The majority of your customers are small business owners. The majority of the people, at least businesses that were affected by the pandemic, were small businesses. And that must have been super intense as like that kind of being like your core yeah. base of customers, seeing what they're going through, seeing so many of them being shut down, either by the government or for all sorts of reasons, because nobody wants to leave their house. Right. Um, but for some, in some cases forcibly shut down. Um, what, what gets you out of that to this incredible win and this incredible partnership and now merger with bill.com? Cause that must not have been obvious at the beginning of the pandemic that you would have a win that significant. No, it wasn't obvious, but it was about two months into the pandemic where I understood the, the strategy to, to make sure that we had a strong and enduring business um, with incredible clarity. So, yeah, real quick, uh, March of 2020, all of a sudden, all hell is breaking loose. Uh, mandates and shutdowns are happening. Small business is absolutely getting obliterated, right? There's no travel, there's nothing. And then what Clint just said about my business at Divi, we are extending lines of credit to businesses along with software that helps them spend their money smarter, right? Spend management and expense management software. But behind the scenes, that also means that we have a pretty significant credit portfolio, where which is a, a, a pretty significant risk. So all we were able to do was look back at 2008 and 2009 at this, you know, this cohort data and try to extrapolate of how is this going to perform and behave. And not only was it intense, it was pretty terrifying in March and April. We had no idea 
uh, how our customers were going to behave. We had taken great care prior to March of 2020 um, to bring in high quality businesses that are credit worthy, to ha that had you know very sustainable revenue, they were profitable businesses. And so we had put in place underwriting measures that should have withstood some elements of a, a normal recession, but this was abnormal, this was not normal. And so that's where the fear really crept in. Come April, our customers are doing all right. But more strategically, what we did right then is we inserted ourselves into the PPP process. We worked with one of our bank partners, Cross River Bank. Uh, we built this incredible onboarding software that kind of circumvented a lot of kind of what the government was doing of some of their forms, meaning that we were able to do it faster than what the government could um, to ensure that not only our customers, but really anyone that would apply through us could, could get access to PPP uh, as fast as possible. And, and that was an absolute uh, lifeline to our customers in, in a bought time, right? It, which is really what the intent of PPP was, not just for our customer base, but for anyone. Let's just buy time until we understand uh, kind of what the patterns and uh, how businesses are going to um, uh, react and how consum consumers are going to react through the pandemic. But then here's what we understood. And this goes back to the conversation of being a venture backed business or a bootstrap business. Um, that as a venture backed business, especially in the early stages, you are reliant on just more venture capital to accelerate growth and to keep going. And I knew in the back of my mind, I never wanted to be dependent again on venture capital. I didn't want, like, I didn't want that to be our lifeline, that I wanted to be able to look inside at our business and say, nope, we have a strong and mature business. We can survive regardless of what's going on on the outside. And the only way to do that was to assess our product. Our product at that point from a go-to-market perspective was very direct sales heavy, which means that we were pretty bloated uh, on a sales and marketing headcount perspective, customer success perspective. We just had a lot of people, wonderful people, but a lot of them. And we knew that in order to survive and to build an enduring business, we would have to figure out how to automate, not all, but the majority of what was going on in our go-to-market um, uh, process, um, that we needed a process where customers could come to our website and just be full self-serve uh, from the credit underwriting to onboarding to using the product and that they would be successfully inserted to the product and off to the races. And it was such a difficult decision because that ultimately meant we need to let go of a lot of people as a forcing function, we need to let go, shed a significant capital expense, and then move our product and engineering resources to building out now this massive gap that we've created in our business, uh, which needs to become tech enabled. And so we just had to bite the bitter pill. And it was so difficult, so many tears shed because you're saying bye to friends that have given so much of their time and energy and their creativity to divvy as well. Um, but we knew that that was the right step. And then it was only about two months later after doing that, it was in July, maybe August of, so of 2020, where it was working really well, probably August, if I'm going to be honest, um, where that self-serve internal product that we built just took off like lightning, where we, you know, previously were landing a couple hundred customers a month, immediately we're doubling that. We are tripling that just because of how well that had worked out. Now that was the design in your head. Rarely does it ever work out that way. And, and we are just incredibly blessed and fortunate that it literally worked out as designed. Well, I could, I could, tell, I could tell the pain in your voice and your expression as you talked about having to let some people go during all of that and what that process is like. And I, and I know yeah. you took great care to make sure that they... Um, were put in other companies, but a lot of people wouldn't know. So, so how did you help knowing that you were going to have to make that decision? How did you help these employees who were like a family to you? And, and it's obviously, you know, anyone watching this or listening to this can tell that it matters to you. Yeah. Um, once we were in a position to, we were able to rehire a lot of them, those that wanted to come back, right? We, we didn't hold uh, blame on anyone that felt burned or didn't want to come back because I, I think I'd probably fall in that category, but uh, we, we worked with 100% of them. 
uh, worked with 100% of them to make sure that they had jobs. I think successfully, we we're well over 90% of them landed jobs as a direct result of our people in places team um, that just networked the hell out of the, the Utah ecosystem. Um, and in most cases, they landed up you know, landed in scenarios uh, where they were making more money now than they were at Divi at a startup. And so that was a all hands on deck uh, where you know, sales leaders were posting about it on their social media channels. They were back channeling with their peers and, and all of us just worked pretty much overtime until the majority. And then we took care of the long tail also to make sure that they landed in great spots. So, And it, it works, like you said, which, is, which it so rarely does, but it works. And, and this was a huge bet because this is during COVID-19 and businesses are literally shutting down. I mean, the government was handing out like trillions of dollars, right? Just to keep businesses yeah. afloat um it works so not only do you grow but you grow rapidly and it becomes super successful at what point do you start having these conversations with bill.com towards the end of the summer early fall uh, of 2020 and it wasn't just them we had several groups reaching out to us um it's kind of been the story of divi all along they that uh Groups knew that what we had built was special, that we had tapped into and created a new category, um, and they, they wanted access to that. But Bill.com specifically uh, in the fall, early fall, um, and uh, we, we just built a relationship. We spent time with each other. We spent time, a lot of time talking with each other um, about our shared vision, um, about kind of the go forward, what the ecosystem could and should look like in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and that's really what we focused on. <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, we actually continued fundraising. And so be, getting acquired wasn't a priority to me. Making sure Divi mm -hmm. uh, would grow orders of magnitude was the priority. And so we did end up raising uh, another round, but it was a very opportunistic round of some some awesome investors that believed in us, PayPal being one of them, right? Which it came with uh, um, elements of commercial agreements and distribution. So an opportunity to really flex our muscle and, and, and grow uh, even more. Um, but then we just uh, just kept communicating with Bill.com and it was after the holiday breaks of Christmases um, in January when the, the talks picked up in earnest. I have two final questions for you, then I'll let you go. And again, you got to come back on because yeah. you and I could talk about a lot of this stuff uh, uh, for hours. My second to final question is this. How important is faith to you? This is another thing that you've brought up in this mm -hmm. conversation, whether people are, are catching on with that or not. I've caught it a number of times. You you went on a, a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I, I assume, I'm just assuming here that it's probably where like your language skills were, were developed and probably helped along with the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, CIA, CIA stuff and all that stuff that, that you were just going. How important is faith in your life? Yeah, it's a really material um, aspect, and it's 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 kind of the blanket that I think covers the pillars of my life instead of it being a pillar of my life, which I think a lot of people like to visualize. You know, I am a dad, I am a CEO, I like fishing, whatever, right? Whatever the the pillars of an individual, it's the wrapper around it all. Um, in a less dogmatic way, also, in a more of I. Uh, respect and believe in, in a higher calling. It's it's kind of spoken to my core in, in very meaningful ways. And because of that, I'm not willing to ignore that. Um, it's, I, I've, I've just been too fortunate in, in my life to ignore uh, some pretty deep experiences. And so it, it ends up navigating uh, a lot of my decision-making. We're careful not to let that creep into the workplace. I think if you surveyed the Divi employees, uh, they would say that this is about as agnostic as it gets, especially for a Utah company. We're just a respecter of it all. Um, but it, it governs a lot of how I think a lot of, um, of just trying to be a good dude, like kind, generous, thoughtful. It motivates me to try to be better uh, on a daily best uh, on a daily basis instead of just resting on my laurels. I think a lot of people after a big exit uh, would be like, I freaking did it. Like I'm done. And I couldn't be more motivated than ever to scale kind of my life uh, than right now. And I think that's not driven than from anything other than the, the faith aspect of just trying to be, you know, scaled in all aspects of my life. So it's big.
My final question for you is what is the best piece of leadership advice you've received or what is the best piece of leadership advice you would give to those who are listening or watching this as they think about your journey and what has helped you the most? Um, it's a super simple phrase. Um, you are what you do. Uh, it's, it's, and that is just critical to me. It's, it's how I think about my own personal leadership. It's how I think about recruiting. Um, it, there's a lot of people that are fantastic at, at thinking and at saying, um, but are not great at finish lining, at creating, at building, at making people feel great. And you are what you do. And I think a lot of leaders fall short of that. And once they're able to really internalize that, uh, I think that you see a more well-rounded person once they internalize that. And I wish that was something that I understood with greater clarity. I understood the principle, but with truly greater clarity, clarity when I was younger, because it's been pretty uh, formative for me. You are what you do. Blake Murray, CEO, co-founder of Divi. Blake, love you, man. Thank you so much for coming on here. Again, let's have you back. And congrats on the success. Congrats on everything that's happened with Build.com. And uh, best of luck, my friend. I really appreciate you doing this. Thanks, Clint. Appreciate it, man.